Tonight's episode is brought to you by Cook Unity, direct from the chef to you. For 50% off, go to cookunity.com forward slash reach. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Narrative. After eight years and well over 500 episodes of Narrative, it was a welcome sight, I must admit, when Donald Trump entered the courtroom and lurched his way to the defendant's table. Finally, it seems, a chip in Donald Trump's seemingly Teflon armor had been achieved. He was finally going to face some justice. Now, I've been on the record about what I think about this particular case and why I believe it doesn't stand up to the quality and severity of the other three cases. But, you know, at least this was a trial, and at least it was a trial going ahead before the elections. We have a tradition on this show of speaking truth to power and tackling the most pressing issues of our time. And ever since the jury selection began in this trial, I've been thinking about whether it'll reshape the election campaign. Steve Schmidt has advised presidents run game-changing campaigns and become an eloquent defender of democracy. His writings in the warning newsletter have marked him as a singular voice of moral clarity in his generation. And I'm thrilled he's joining us tonight on Narrative to discuss the trial and the upcoming election. And we welcome Steve Schmidt to the show today. How are you, Steve? I'm good, Zev. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. You know, based on the current swing state polling, if the election were held today, it does seem to me that Donald Trump could win that election. In most of these swing states, he's still six points ahead of Joe Biden. Are we looking at a likely second administration for Donald Trump? I wouldn't say likely, but he could win. No question about it. And in fact, if the election were tomorrow, he probably would win. You know, the reality is that you know, his calculus going into this election is that there's enough indifference out there, plus the fanaticism of his base to get him over the top. You know, Chris Sununu was utterly humiliated, exposed for a really uh, level of cynicism that's hard to articulate with George Stephanopoulos on Sunday. One of the things the New Hampshire governor said is that you know, Trump is supported by 51% of the country. That has never been the case. It will never be the case. There will never be a majority of Americans that support this. Question is, can it take power with a minority over a majority will? And the answer to that question is yes, that could happen. And, you know, Biden is a weak candidate in this race. He has enormous liabilities uh, in the campaign because this is a communication business. And it's going to be a campaign where, you know, in the end, the American people are going to have to evaluate a staggeringly easy choice to make in the context of considerations around the destiny of the country, where we're going, what's happening, you know, what is Trump? What is his movement? What does it stand for? What does it believe in? Is it dangerous? You know, all these questions are now in front of the, in front of the country who's had a rather naive view about it, you know, for much of the last decade, which, you know, will be remembered historically as really the Trump era. Incredibly, it's gone on for almost 10 years in America now. I know it is stunning, that amount of time. I and mean, I'm just thinking about how long I've been doing this podcast. When you think about eight years of your life and it's like eight years of, of how much time it's yeah. to deal with Donald Trump, it's just unbelievable. But we talk about you know, the, this valuation that you point out. You didn't talk about the trials that Donald Trump may or may not have to deal with. Certainly the hush money case has sort of begun now. The Democrats have a lot of weight invested in some sort of criminal outcome changing what, what Americans decide in November. Do you view that kind of optimism that some Democrats have that a conviction in this case, the hush money case, are enough to really push Biden over, over Donald Trump? I've done consulting work on political campaigns all over the world. And you go into a different country and they hire American consultants and there's this belief embedded in that hire that the American consultant is going to bring some sort of magic bullet, right? Some sort of elixir into the race, some alchemy that just because through presence, they're going to win. And it doesn't work like that. These criminal cases have been a debacle, 
a debacle for the cause of defeating Donald Trump. Now, there's only one of them that is going to trial before the election, and that's the one we're in right now. There's no question in my mind that the lead up to it has benefited Trump enormously. That being said, watching him come into the courtroom is a diminishing event. You know, this is somebody who is stripped of his trappings, his accoutrement. The fact is that he is now outside of his terrarium like a fish outside of the tank. There is no crowd assembled as in the Mar-a-Lago dining room to stand and applaud when he appears. He is being subjected to the same rules like everybody else. And I think he appears a lot like the Wizard of Oz, right? You know, unmasked from behind the screen. So we'll see what the accumulation of that is over, over eight weeks time. I do believe this, and I wrote about it today, presidential campaign in my view, is the greatest non-lethal competition in the world, period. And it's a contact sport. The contact that the the, the, of it manifests at a psychological level. And so you put a picture of Donald Trump up on the screen, and the one that I gravitated to from yesterday is the image coming through the doors. Does he look happy? He does not look happy. This is, does, <laughs> does, does he look like he's going home with a spring in his step to bound through the door at Trump Tower to make love to his beautiful Melania in the late afternoon? That is not what he appears to be doing, though. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what he does. Hey, everybody, it's Zev Shalev here. What are you having for dinner? I know I've been craving this incredible dish from my local engine place just up the street. The flavors there are just so complex, really satisfying meal. But it's not always easy to find the time or the money to eat out, especially at that Indian place. Now, that's where Cook Unity comes in. Cook Unity is the first chef to use service that delivers locally sourced meals from award-winning chefs right to your door every week. I gave it a try and was blown away by the quality and taste of the meals. I ordered a few different dishes the first time round, including a delicious vegan curry and a perfectly cooked salmon. Every meal was just bursting with flavor, and it tasted like it came straight from a gourmet restaurant. Plus, the portions were so generous, and the prices, frankly, were much more affordable than other meal delivery services I've tried. What I love about Cook Unity is that it supports local chefs and suppliers. Each meal is handcrafted in local micro-kitchens using fresh, sustainable ingredients. And with hundreds of dishes to choose from, including options from various dietary preferences like gluten-free and paleo, there's something really for everybody. The best part, Cook Unity's packaging is eco-friendly, so you can feel good about reducing food waste and also supporting a more sustainable way of eating. If you'd like to experience the chef quality meals delivered right to your door, go to cookunity.com forward slash reach or into the code reach, R-E-A-C-H, before you check out and you'll get 50% off your first week. That's right, 50% off your first week by using the code reach or going to cookunity.com forward slash reach. Trust me, your taste buds will thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you exactly what he does. He leaves enraged, and he goes home, and he puts the television on, and he surveils it, all of it. He watches all the jokes made about him for his enemies list. He evaluates all of the sycophants that are auditioning to be vice president. He's available for flattery from the detritus that surrounds him. This is a time where you know where he is, what he's watching. And this is when he should be visited by the campaign, taunting him, mocking him, diminishing him, destabilizing him and his team to put him off balance. In the end, Whomever the person is that wins the race is going to be the candidate that is able to make the race about the other person. In other words, if the race is about you, you will be the losing candidate. The race has to be about Trump. Incredibly, this massive propaganda apparatus that surrounds MAGA, manifested in Fox, Newsmax, 
OAN, all this bullshit has been able to destroy Biden's reputation for competence, for probity, for, for rectitude, after a lifetime of getting to know the guy. It's incredible to watch. It's a huge failure on the part of the White House. But this is a Rocky Apollo Creed fight. Middle of the ring, the president has to debate him, has to face him, and has to do the equivalent of knocking this disgraceful, disgusting bully on his ass. That's the job that at age 82, Biden has demanded that he get to do again. And so he needs to do it. And we have 202 days left for him to be able to do it in a time of growing, momentous crisis in the world. Let's, let's ask, follow up on some of this stuff, because if we have a trial here that ends up in a conviction for Donald Trump, what does that do to the race versus, let's say, a hung jury in this case? I think it shrinks him to nothingness. He will be revealed over the course of the trial to be what I believe him to be, which is a low-life criminal. That being said, and I, I've said this, right, through all of this, is that the American people have to believe in their institutions here, right, and have to have faith in them. What Donald Trump did, and I say this as someone who placed a concession phone call, I placed it for John McCain to Barack Obama, is break his oath and assault in the most dastardly way possible the cornerstone of American civilization the peaceful transition of power, and the apportionment of political power through the outcome of an election. Now, his fate rests in the hands of a jury of his peers. And make no mistake, right, this Manhattan jury is a jury of his peers. Donald Trump is of this place, heart and soul. And so even his most ferocious critics, like me, have to be the people who are the most steadfast in demanding that those jurors, those citizens, follow their oath and give him a fair trial. But if he's found guilty, then it's going to hurt him, is what all of the polling seems to suggest. And I just don't believe that there is a movement of Americans out there that will rally to the jailhouse and surround it to break their guy out. You have a couple hundred people at the most on the streets. This is a TV show. And Trump, at the end of the day, is a philosopher of fuck youism. That's his appeal. Yeah. If you obliterate trust in every institution in the country, and your average person out there looks at government, they're not expecting a result. They just want to deliver a little bit of agitation back towards the people that have been, for the last 10 years, completely destabilized by Trump. The banks, the tech companies, whatever it may be, the elite of the country. Trump is their vessel, not to make their lives better, but to deliver a type of sugar high, mm -hmm. a fuck you. Because right? sometimes that fuck you feels good, right? Whether you're driving down the road. Sure, yeah. And any time, any day of the week might be time for a delicious fuck you to someone. <laughs> and so nine years in, right, we, we, we have this situation, and that's what this guy is. And in order to be, and put it away, you have to offer better. And the reality is, right, and this is true, there's 500 background quotes to back it up. The Biden team wanted Trump. They did. They wanted Absolutely. him in the race, right? Because he was the patsy, right? He was the easiest opponent. He was the guy that justified the rationale for Biden to run for a second term. Only Biden can beat Trump, beat him again. He'll knock him on his ass again. But hey, uh-oh, somewhere along the way, right? Yeah. Now Biden's the incumbent. Trump's the challenger, right? What was up is down and down is up and red is blue and blue is red. And voila, all of a sudden... Trump looks like he's the only guy, right, that any Democrat, right, could conceivably be beaten by, right, is Biden. 
And so it's a, so, but at any rate, wherever we are right now in this moment, the choice is the choice and the choice is Biden versus Trump and it's close race. Now, I'd like a delicious fuck you to anyone on any given day, too. But I'll say this about the the myth around Donald Trump. Yes, this is the vessel for the fuck you for the masters in the red states. But it's also the vehicle, the vessel that's been funded by the richest people in the world, by these foreign nations, by these networks of, you know, dynastical, you know, hereditary rights and all these other things. And and yet, you know, uh, somehow that has not gotten through to Republican supporters. They get that he does the fuck you really well. They, they don't get the fact that it's a con. It's another Donald Trump con. He is basically being presented to them as that fuck you, but it's not really what he is. He really is just another vessel for the very rich and the very entitled to preserve their ability to pass down wealth from generation to generation or whatever else they might be aiming at doing. There's this wonderful quote by President Kennedy from his inaugural speech, which I, I think is one of, one of the, the great addresses of all time. But in it, he says, beware to the foolish men who seek power by trying to ride the back of the tiger that they wind up inside the tiger. And that's what this is, right? So Donald Trump is the leader of an autocratic movement, but he is not in and of himself enough. So... Is he a charismatic leader who has the skills to maintain a position atop a political movement that's called the personality? Yes. Yes. But he also needs the cynicism of the elites. People like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz. Do those people respect the crowd at a Trump rally, right? Harvard University's Ted Cruz and Stanford University's Josh Hawley? <laughs> For those people. They think they're Marx, Rubes. They're disgusted by them. They need the propaganda. They need the big lie. Do they have that? Do they have the money? Do they have people looking for the transaction? Do they have a guy like Steve Schwartzman, right, who will write a check, spend tens of millions on this because he's looking for a return on an investment? And this is a great payoff. You can walk in and get a lot of stuff out of this when the most corrupt person in American history runs for office at the end of what's a billion dollar operation. So yeah, it has been astonishing, astonishing to watch the grift, the mainstreaming of it. And I think the indifference towards it by a great deal of the media. And I always think about the old lady and I always, envision her as an old lady living on a fixed income social security check who's writing the five dollar check to this you know maybe twice a month maybe four times a month and it's appalling but it is exactly as you say but there's a menagerie of people there's the cynic and the dupe there's the businessman and his transaction, and there's the ideologist. There's the Stephen Miller. There's, does, does your average billionaire want to build vast concentration camps for the migrants? No. But Stephen Miller does. The problem and the danger with Trump is the billionaire and his wife who will be rubbing shoulders with the celebs at the Met Gala, will write the check completely indifferent towards the building of the camps mm -hmm. for the migrants, completely indifferent towards the rhetoric about locking up a political opponent. I tend to think about this like a river. And I drove my son across the country this summer, did a road trip. And when you're at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, it's a small stream. It doesn't stay that way, but we're nine years into this. And so we're a good ways down that river from where it began. And as we look out ahead at this race, you see in a way that's really different today than you did five, six years ago, where everybody has their skin in the game on this. It's Donald Trump, right? <laughs> Donald Trump was a Manhattan libertine. Right. The, the idea that Donald Trump has 15 tongue speaking 
Christian pastors, Christian <laughs> nationalist pastors laying hands on them. As somebody who grew up in northern New Jersey, it is, it's incredible. It's incredible. Beyond belief. It is incredible, but that message is not getting through. The, uh, the GOP has been able to somehow cement, you know, Trump as some sort of deity and the Democrats have not been able to convince people that he is a con artist. I mean, maybe there's a possibility that during this case, you know, these con artist, you know, roots may come out, but I'm not sure it will. I mean, I think at the end of the day, he, this may end up being a hung jury and we may land up in a situation where it actually, it just sort of bakes in what everyone already knows about him. Yeah, he's a bad guy, he's a con artist and we don't really care. And plus the jury didn't even find him guilty in that. So, hey, he must be electable. He got elected president, right? I mean, yeah. so, I, you know, look, he can't, you can't say he's unelectable, right? Or he can't, he can't manage to do it again. I was on a plane the other day. And I, I was in coach, I was in the middle seat and you have judgments, right? That, that you bring, right? Prejudices. And so, you know, I got the guy next to me, I have CNN on, he puts Fox on. We're watching the missiles in the air on their, on their way to Israel. As soon as he put Fox on, you know, I just say to myself, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> you know, but I'm watching him <laughs> and he's watching Fox. We even have some small talks. As the missiles are on, on, on the way to Israel, Fox cuts away. And they go to a Trump rally. And it was amazing watching the guy watch Trump because if it was a movie, right, it would be a science fiction movie. And it was like he was idiotized watching the screen. All of a sudden, you know, guy in his 50s had his cocked, yeah. out his open, he's got this <laughs> smile on. And it's like he's hypnotized yeah. by it. And there is a voice on television telling us something. There's an election result that's also telling us something. And there's a crowd size out in front of that Manhattan courtroom that's telling us something. I, I have a 20 year old that goes to University of Iowa. Every, all those kids, when Trump went to Iowa, wanted to go see Trump, right? It, it's a cultural phenomenon where who doesn't want, did you want to see the Britney Spears show? Excuse me, did you want to see the Taylor Swift concert? Do you I want to see the actually, Donald Trump yeah. show, right? Yeah. Like you people want to see the spectacle. Yeah. And so there's that aspect of it. But at the heart of what you're talking about, like I, I think is this kind of duality with Trump. He's two things at once. And I deeply believe this, like to the core of my being, that like probably the survival of our country requires an adult sensibility that seems to be going extinct, which is to hold complex, contradictory thoughts in the head at the same time. You know, Trump is the most prolific liar who's ever been president, but bar not. No one else has told 35,000 lies in four years. But strangely, he's also the most honest president we've ever had. He speaks in idiomatic English. No speech writers. There's no flowery language. He looks out and he has the wisdom of the drunk at the edge of the bar, right? Yeah. Out of every funny things, right, that he says, when you do the accounting on it, there can be deep kernels of wisdom and truth in there. And so the American people, 40% of which don't have $400 cash available, look at all of this and again, they see something and they see the world differently than the way the people in the green rooms in Washington see the world. And that chasm requires Democrats to meet those people where they are, not the other way around. And so Joe Biden's got a really enormous obligation and responsibility and challenge over the next 202 days. They really got to take the fight to the sky. And the American people have to step up. You know, have we lost our faith. Have we lost our religion, so to speak, our secular religion about the ideas, the ideals that came up out of the ground about 250 years ago and have created the most complex, wealthiest society in the history of human civilization. Are we ready to cash it in? That's the question at hand. Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. And, you know, it is also, I believe you're correct in saying that we're seeing a message in the crowd sizes and we're seeing a message in just the people showing up for those Trump campaigns events. He's just not going to be as popular as he was 
even the first time around, there's just no ways. And he's certainly not going to be, I don't think, as as popular as he was uh, the second time around, obviously, because he can't match those numbers. So what we're looking at is an opportunity now for Joe Biden to be what I think is Joe Biden's best. You know, I think he comes out swinging incredibly well when he talks about democracy, when he talks about, you know, what America really is and about the values of this country. And I suspect the next 200 days he can do that. What I'm concerned about as well is what this ecosystem of um, Newsmax, Fox News, this, this right-wing ecosystem you describe, along with the, their foreign network of funders or you know whoever they might be in, this, in the enemies of democracy who might be funding all of this, their ability to shape the election can come in, in a number of ways. They can do things like they've been doing, which is uh, showing how weak a candidate Biden is in terms of his ability to communicate and other factors. But they also have a global stage on which they can play. I mean, you've got things like the, the Gaza war happening. You've got a potential conflict with Taiwan. You've got, you know, October surprises as well as anybody. I mean, anything can happen in those next 200 days where, sure, Joe Biden might do an incredible job of defending democracy. But there are opportunities for all sorts of things to happen on the way to November. Can you talk a little bit about what those might be and how the Biden campaign can prepare for those? Well, I think the hardest thing to appreciate about politics for most people, when I, if I go out, you know, just to dinner and it's a bunch of couples and people, this is what they want to talk about, right? You know, everyone wants to talk about, everyone wants to talk about politics. And you listen to the White House, right? And this is a competition again. Think about a football game. Think about the commentators on Thursday going to the coaches and they, what's your game plan, right? So we're up in the booth and, you know, we can evaluate it. We can talk about it. And so the Biden strategy, it seems to me, and I think it seems to them, is deeply reliant on there's going to be a moment when we tell you things about what we did that you're not paying attention to yet. And when we tell you and remind you or you find out about it, voila, you're for Biden. That's not how this works. The election ahead is going to be shaped and determined by events that have not yet occurred. What happened a few days ago with the firing of hundreds of missiles, crews, ballistic drones at Israel is derivative of what happened on October 7th, cause and effect. Mm. And now there will be the next effect and the next cause. And what the world looks like six months from now is hard to guess. However, the fixed variables, character, competence, sanity, all of those things, are static. And so the application of those qualities to the coming events is what the campaign is about at its core. That is the choice, is that as the stakes go higher, the risks go up and Trump should be defined as the risk in a way that's meaningful. Again, coming back to what should be going on while he's in a state of rage, it's the opportunity, as Carville pointed out once, when your opponent's drowning, you don't throw him a life jacket, you drop a bowling ball on him. Mm. And it's that hour for Trump. It's to destabilize him, destabilize the family, destabilize the campaign, make these people fight one another. And this is fundamental to how you beat him. You laugh at him, you mock him, you cut him. When somebody has an image in his cult of being 40 feet tall, how do I hurt the cult leader? By yelling at the cult members or by letting them see that other people are laughing at the cult leader? Because some of those people will get in on the joke. First one, then another, and another. And that's why most cults ultimately don't last as long as America has lasted. It's true. I want to turn to a couple of other things. We met, first met way back in 2008 when you were involved in the John McCain campaign and so was Nicole Wallace. I was at CBS News, and there was an interview that Sarah Palin did with Katie Couric, which landed up, any say, changing the course of the campaign. 
we've never spoken about it since. I'm curious to know if there's anything you want to share about how that whole series of events unfolded and why you did that. Well, look, I, I've talked a lot about Sarah Palin over the interviewing years. There's been movies. I've, you know, done a lot of interviews with Katie and I finally told, you know, all the details of it. Uh, and the reality was, you know, the McCain campaign was a chaotic affair. I got involved when the campaign collapsed. I was a volunteer all the way through. I never got paid. He came back. He wins the Republican nomination. I, you know, he certainly gave me a lot of credit for that. Took it over again when he was down 15, 16 points in the early spring and summer. And, you know, at the time, the two responsibilities I, I was not given were the VP search and the, the convention. And she was picked. I was blamed for it for a very long time. And the reality was, is that I was deeply enmeshed in an issue that I was deeply unhappy to be enmeshed in, which was the suicide attempt of John McCain's longtime mistress, who he had lied to the country about. And he made me complicit in the lie because about a month after everything went down with that, he looks at me backstage somewhere and he fesses up, right? And he says that everything he had denied in this news conference was true. So for many years of my life, after the McCain campaign ends, the only way, right, I'm ever able to say, listen, don't blame me for this pale and debacle. I was 37 years old. The guy who picked her is the Republican nominee. And I was dealing with the fallout for all of this stuff over here. And the only way to explicate myself from that decision is to tell that story. And I ultimately did, and I talked about all the reasons that I did to stop, frankly, a fair amount of abuse from his daughter that worked and that I've never heard her say my name out loud again, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, when I look back on that chapter, it was astounding and disorienting because Katie Cork asked no unfair questions, right? If you say to a candidate, what do you read? And again, this is important. It wasn't that Sarah Palin couldn't answer the question. That was her version of telling Katie Cork to go fuck herself for asking the question, right? And so that's again, right? The philosophy of fuck you is, and when you deliver to fuck you, <laughs> right? You know, sometimes you want to counsel someone, yeah, you know, yeah, fuck you might feel good, but do you really need to shoot yourself in the foot to do it, right? But but she does. The, the Republican Party I grew up in was the pull up your bootstraps party. It was like, don't complain, right? You know, you have it good. You have it better than anyone else has ever had it in the family. I, I mean, it was not a, you know, it was not an empathetic philosophy, right? And if you screwed up, you may, you were accountable. You were responsible, right? This was the core philosophy, right, of, of Reaganism at some level, right? Personal responsibility. And so it was an amazing moment to watch in real time, a new reaction manifest itself that all of a sudden, right, the evidence of press bias, right, wasn't an actual bias that you could point to, but it was an obvious question that should have been easily answered. From my perspective, and, and you know, I've read some of the stuff you've, you've said about this, but it's you and uh, Nicole were quite impressive in your you know, immense patriotism. I mean, you saw something as well that was not was not right in that VP choice, obviously, and took that responsibility quite seriously in making sure that was not hidden from the world. And that's a remarkable statement about you and Nicole in terms of your ability to be crystal clear about what, you know, about your duty to society. And in many ways, I see that still as what you both do and certainly what you do on a, every day. And Yet you face so much opposition to that, especially when you know, I think about your Lincoln Project days where there was a lot of, you know, not even just misinformation and disinformation about you, but actually attacks against you. And I'm curious about how you manage that. You know, how do you manage this notion where you're doing all the stuff that you know is right and you're doing your duty and your political instincts are firing in just the right way. And yet you're constantly under the sort of barrage of attacks and, and being discredited. I spent some time last week. She's been in the news. I was at a I was at a documentary documentary premiere in Washington D.C. for a movie that I'm in. It's called Bad Faith. It's about Christian nationalism, 
And there's an NBC News reporter. She was an NBC News reporter. She's a Politico reporter now. Heidi Presbola, who is as competent, fair, smart as I really, I, I, she's been doing this for as long as I have just about and type of reporter. I have no idea like what her politics are. She said something on television. She was asked a question about what Christian nationalism is. And you know, I think she later said that, you know, it's uh, Tom Brady was a client of mine, you know, back in my consulting days, even Tom Brady throws an interception, right? You know, he'll, you know, drop back and even Tom Brady throw the fucking ball right to the other guy, yeah. right? Every now and then. Absolutely. And so she said some of the answer, but the attacks, the targeting by people who were supposed to be religious leaders and the threat of it. And you talk to people who are longtime political commentators and they might say something to you like, would you stay in the country if Trump won? Are you afraid? Do you worry? You talk to people that have big profiles, I, I, I think, in if you were to measure it, less than mine, but who are constantly bullied, harassed, and everything else. There was a story that AP wrote, right, that 40, I got 45 minutes notice from a reporter. This guy's a national political reporter. And he says, we're writing a story. We brought your house with Lincoln Project money. Wasn't true. I lived in the house for three years. Fox News put the house on the television. Hundreds of boxes of human shit arrived at the house. I had to leave. I had, a, I had to move. But I don't know how to back up out of this, right? I was astounded by this. And I, am, I will always be astounded by it. The Lincoln Project, which I founded and led, in 2020, raised $100 million about, spent 84% of it on voter contact programs, and did about $3 billion worth of impact. So like it, hate it, love it or not, I am an American citizen running a big political organization that is supported by hundreds of thousands of people and has a followership in one year that's bigger than both national political parties. We are attacked constantly by the most powerful person in the world for daring to oppose them. And in the aftermath of that, there are a million plus dollars at least of flyers that are sent out that are assassination bait claiming that I'm a pedophile to every zip code around where I live. And there's not one news organization in America that thought that was a news story, not one. So let me ask you a question. If I found that organization and I build it and it succeeds and the consequence is that what I just described, plus the flyers, mm. do the reporters not understand that the First Amendment applies to the citizen also, that there is no press freedom without citizen freedom, that the intimidation runs up and down, right? Members of Congress are terrified, state senators, state reps, school board. We live in a society of intimidation. And so in the end, as a choice, I'm not leaving the country if he would. Right. And if he deploys the tanks, I'll be the first guy outside the gate laying down in front of him. being an American means being defiant and resisting this bullshit and being unafraid of it. Right. And I was in Poland two weeks ago and you think about what happened to Poland in the Second World War, the death, the Holocaust principally plays out there, the Soviet subjugation that follows. And you think about all of these issues that we talk about, the campaign, right? But in the end, these are all, freedom is a moral issue. It's a moral construct, right? The, the, all of its hideous alternatives are fundamentally immoral constructs. And so John Paul, Carol Wotila becomes Pope and he goes to Krakow and he goes to Warsaw 
And what's his message? What is the message that breaks the back of Soviet totalitarianism? This movie star handsome guy. And everyone forgets, right, you know, John Paul in 1979, right, when he was in his 50s. What was his message? His message was, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And if there is one thing I never expected in my life that anybody would know who I was, right? The, the idea that I would be any level of fame, people would stop you on the street, recognize you. If there is one, one that, that I can model, that if I get run over by a bus later today, right, that my, that my kids can be proud of, right, that people could point to, it would be that I hope to do, which is this, do not be afraid of this. Do not rise up against this, right? And so no matter what they say, no matter what they do, right, I am who I am on the basis of my conduct not the smears against me, right? Not the ugliness directed against me. And you just have to walk forward into that and appreciate. And it's tougher some days than others, but to really embrace judge me by my enemies, right? And when I look at the accumulation of my enemies, they are a rogues gallery of scumbags for the ages. And their intensity of their hatred for me means I know when I close my eyes at night that I have had an impact. Um, and if I did it, then I wouldn't have that hate from those people. And I'm proud of it. You certainly have. I mean, you had incredible impact. And you continue every day in your incredible Substack that I hope everyone subscribes to and in your work everywhere else. I just think you've been able to do so much for this country and it speaks volumes about who you are. And even at the toughest times, you've been able to again and again, prove your patriotism and your, your real intentions. So I salute you for that. And I also thank you very much for being on the show tonight. It's been a real pleasure having you on. It's great pleasure, Zev. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. One day you'll tell the story of autocrats, crooks, and kings who came for our freedom. A story of citizens who stood up to tyranny and won. The people prevailed and renewed an old vow to a more perfect union. And that was just the beginning. The story continues. Narrative. Where truth lives. <laughs>